Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. We are still at COFA as the Congress on the Future of Engineering Software for our second annual partnership with them. We are now sitting down with Christian Thompson. Hello. Hey, pleasure Th to meet you. Yeah, thanks for coming on to the show. Yeah. Really appreciate it. Very excited to talk to you all the way from Denmark originally. That's yep. And now lives in New York working on end topology. End topology, he's doing software engineering, physics, and optimization there. And Topology is doing really cool work in engineering software for advanced manufacturing. We're going to be breaking that down. Um, at Technical University of Denmark, Christian did a Master of Science in Engineering Design and Applied Mechanics and was also doing research assisting there. So Christian, let's start things off with this, with this uh, perspective on your journey. So how did you get interested in engineering and in design and software? How did you get interested in these fields? Yeah, so I've always, you know, been interested in in how things work and how you know we can describe physical phenomena with with models, and have been curious about how yeah technology works. And so I think it's it's natural to go into into engineering. That I think that was the, the my na you know the most natural thing for me to do. And so um, after so after high school, you know, I went directly into um, the technical university of Denmark, where I decided to I was I wasn't quite sure whether or not I wanted to go with math or with mechanical engineering mm -hmm. but ultimately I decided to go with mechanical because it also had some you know physical aspects to it so you know you model real life things and you know I saw that as being you know the way I could provide you know most value create mo uh, you know the biggest difference and so I like to, you know, see, you know, abstraction is a good thing, but I also like to, you know, see that it actually, you know, the things I'm working on actually has an impact on, 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 you know, the things that, the work that you do has an impact on the, on the industry and, you know, and yeah. so, so af after I started at university, I, I still wasn't sure, you know, whether or not I wanted to go with the traditional route or, or I wanted to do more math or I wanted to do optimization. But after some time, you know, I, I was really inspired by, you know, the way you, you know, how, how we with computation, with, we, we, we are able to set up models which allow us to, you know, use computers to actually drive design. So take the manual, yes. take the manual uh, steps of a design process away and let the computer do the work because you know technology is evolving so fast and there is definitely a, an opportunity here for us to, to to use that to our advantage and i think that's really what what got me interested in optimization in general and also you know to, in order to make it, it it usable you know and put it in into a real product and and have solve real you know solve real problems you know, you also need to, you know, it needs to be available in, you know, in a CAD system or in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in an engineering software way. So that, I think th this combination was really what sparked my, you know, interest for, for uh, computer, you know, software and, you know, simulation driven design and, yeah. and uh, you know, all these things. Yeah. Yeah. Looking, looking back at, at you, uh, first picking up your interest based on your desire to understand how things work. Yes. This is a very frequent thing that we hear from the engineers and the designers yes. and all. And in even just, you know, this insatiable curiosity from young people is that if, if you have that and you can't ever quelch it, you, you're always so excited to learn, you'll go very far in exactly. life. You've got to keep learning and keep understanding how things work. And then if you really get to the level that you did, which you also got into the mechanical engineering side of things, the math mathematical side of things, the computational side of things, that's when you can also um, do things like you're, like you're doing now with optimization. Exactly. It's interesting to think about this, and I'm, I'm interested to hear your perspective about it, which you know I'm sure we'll dig into this in a little bit later, but having the computational power that's now developed over the last like really 70 years up until yes. the peak that it's at now, to, to leverage that to be able to take away all of our mistakes that we make also to be able to run all the permutations much faster than humans can to figure out which yes. one is the most fu optimal functional fit. Yeah, that's it's it's amazing to to see you know how much potential there is in utilizing the computer to figure out you know how should we navigate this huge design space. 
additive manufacturing is really has really you know advanced tremendously over the past years and now all of a sudden you know we have this design freedom which we ha didn't have before and this is really rare optimization and these computer aided technologies shine because now we have much more design freedom and puts the in it gives the engineer so many more options to options to you know more creative freedom but it also comes with you know a greater responsibility in terms of knowledge and decision making and so that is where i think you know using computer aided you know technology you know using these advanced you know mathematical models can really help the engineers and ultimately be able to deliver a product take the product from initial the initial phases all the way to you know production ready in a much shorter time frame yeah yeah and then now when you're when you're doing this this your you, this this optimization and you're you know you're studying you're and you're fit and you're figuring out where you want to go how do you figure out that you know new york and entopology and optimization helping them out with that how did you how did that transition end up happening for you yes so during the the my final year as a graduate student i was working on developing these optimization algorithms you know in more in a more academic sense academic sense and so but i've always you know had this you know this desire to go out and solve real life problems and i i think that is really what kept me you know interested kept my eye open and search for opportunities in, in the industry and so after i graduated i worked some time as a research assistant where i was writing a paper and doing some research and so that is where i you know bradley which is the ceo of entopology he reached out to the research group and that's is where you know i saw my opportunity and so i got in touch with brad and two days after i contacted him you know i was in new york <laughs> and so it was you know an amazing experience and you know and I was, you know, very, you know, much fascinated by 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 the tools that they've already developed. But I yeah. could also see a potential for developing more sophisticated optimization algorithms yeah. using the the knowledge that I had acquired in yeah. the in my time as a, you know doing research. And so I think that yeah. was really what got me, you know, tra yeah, what transitioned me from from academia to to anthropology and. I seriously considered doing a PhD, but I ultimately decided to yeah. go with entomology. And it's funny because the stuff we are doing now is actually the bleeding, working on bleeding edge technology and actually developing new methods. So it's more, you know, almost like a PhD, but not just in the industry. In, the, in industry, you're in industry. and you're actually getting paid for it. Exactly. And <laughs> you're all what you're working on is becoming immediately available, to translating to industry. This is this is what the whole we have so much conversation about what the optimal way to incentivize science is, and a lot of times it's not the PhD exactly. route. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, now teach us about the difference between the optimization algorithms that you were working on, and then what Entopology was had already done with their optimization, and then how you're you know how that's coming together now. Yes. You're helping so what they have done before my arrival at Entopology was uh, lattice based optimization. So they could do optimization of of, of these you know lattice structures. So they have a a a. Uh, I would say they have a great amount of tools available to generate lattice structures and they also had some tools to simulate them and and also do the optimization but and in, lattice structures are mostly like material science wise or uh, what uh, where so, else are they so it you can consider them on multiple levels so what you can do is you can use various homogenization methods to actually consider them as materials and that is something I'm working on now, actually. Okay. Uh, but what they did beforehand was just considering it, it as a lattice structure. So they, when they model them, they actually just look them as beam elements in similar way okay. as you know, conventional mechanical engineering uh, engineers model, let's say truss structures or crane structures okay. and, and so on. Yeah, yeah. And so that by instead of considering, you know, that you know, use only considering uh, the lattices as beam elements that you know puts a restriction on you know the 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 scale by which you you know you can let's if you if you had a structure of let's say 100 million beam elements then you wouldn't be able to 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 model that with with those techniques in a very efficient way so we looked into okay how do we make how do we make um, 
a uh, is there a technology out there which allows you to simulate them much more efficiently and also allow you to uh, simulate more general uh, material structures so let's say gyroid structures honeycomb structures these autotropic or these foam foams and and so in order to simulate those you know you have to look to, to other methods and that's actually some of the stuff i'm working on now but so that was one thing and another thing was uh, we've also been doing uh, again we we try to develop a whole range of different generative um, design process or uh, generative tools to allow the engineer to you know to, to design parts and so all the optimization is another thing that we've been looking into so you know many companies do it out there and we recognize that you know we are not the company which goes out there and blows all competition away because yeah that is not our purpose mm. um, we more see to all the optimization you know as a part of the mm. in part of it's it's a tool in the toolbox so to say mm -hmm. and it's yes. not an end-to-end -end solution yes so we have that functionality but it's, it hasn't been you know our main focus and i've also yes, been working yes. on on developing that you're really conquering a niche as the best aiming to be the best tool on yeah. the tool belt in that niche and you're not the whole tool belt as some people are trying to be just a little bit so on the whole tool belt. so so what we are trying to do essentially so we are right now what we are working on at interbology is an engineering platform where we enable engineering workflows and engineering process try to capture engineering processes in just in one framework all the way from uh, early design phases using generative design tools through simulation so we can also you know perform actually perform simulation and validate the performance of the structures to manufacturing so actually exporting them so we are trying to develop, develop right now we are trying to develop this this framework where we can capture the entire engineering process in one unified system and ultimately you know the the whole you know idea behind this is if you look at you know conventional ways uh, the the way people do design nowadays you know we have the workflow is so disjointed you know you do CAD in maybe SOLIDWORKS and then when you want to do analysis you have to bring into answers or abacus and when you've done the simulation there maybe you figure out ah, I need to do some changes in in back in my, in my CAD model and so all these times you know, I have to navigate or transmit information from one su system to another and it's really a tedious process where yes. manual labor where the engineer he uses a lot of you know valuable time yeah. he wastes waste a lot of valuable time which he instead could have been used on actual real engineering work correct and so that is really what we are trying to do try to you know get rid of all this you know not yeah you know, this the you know try to 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 get rid of all this unnecessary work and try to automate you know these tedious tasks as much as possible by combining all the steps you know into one unified system and then the uh, one the main one that you just talked about a moment ago was the uh, the CAD with the simulation software yes so that when you want to make a tweak in the simulation software you don't have to go and make the tweak back in the CAD and then re-import it yes. into the simulation how how are you then merging those two yeah. so the way we do that is in terms of what we use is we use fields so you can consider anything in terms of fields so what we have in Interbology, we have a or one of the special things about Interbology is that we have an implicit geometry kernel to represent geometry. Mm -hmm. So it's not the conventional way of represented geometry where you have boundary representations, okay. but instead we, what we do is we use math to represent geometry. And what that really allows us to do is to vary, you know, to, so that is essentially you represent geometry in terms of a field. And also, if you look at simulation data, you can also consider that as fields. And so by having almost this unified language as you know, just one field, we can very easily cover yeah, yeah, yeah. these different you know, steps of the engineering design process into, um, into an automated uh, yeah. workflow and get rid of all the, the uh, or the, the very tedious tasks. Correct. And so enable maximal creative engineering time. Exactly. So so what? How do you um, label a? You said it's a it's a geometry kernel. Yes. That is it's 
so your so like a geometry you would give numbers to, and that would be, um, and then when I would tweak that geometry, the math, the numbers would change. Yes. So actually, one way you could think of it is, let's say you have a sphere. So if you want to represent that in our geometry kernel, the way you would do it is you would represent it in terms of you know the equation for a sphere. So it is x squared plus y squared plus z squared minus the radius. And that essentially defines the, the sphere. And what this really also allows us to is store objects in a very lightweight format. And um, that is also, you know, brings us to maybe one of the other very interesting things about you know what we can do, and that is generate huge, you know, huge lattice structures or these periodic structures in, in a very lightweight format. Lightweight formats. Yeah. So for example, you know, in our system we'd be able to generate lattice structures of Hundreds of mil hundreds of millions of beams and be able to load them almost instantaneously. That's really interesting. Yes, yes. And so I think that's really you know one of the strong points of of of, of our system and this wow. implicit geometry kernel. And it's orders of magnitude faster than you know what you can do elsewhere. So it's yeah yeah interesting. And it's so so it's so due due to the light weight of your tech, but the light weight of your tech is due to the geometry kernel, which then just is assigning the, like the x squared plus y squared plus z squared minus the radius. Yes, for a sphere. For yeah. a sphere, you're giving a value to the x, the y, and the z, and the r. Yes, and the final And the final answer. Yes. And you're give, and that, that, those five numbers, the, and the, fi the this, this final, this this way of storing it, yeah, yeah, it gives you a whole sphere, yes, and that way you can load that, and it'll give you the whole exactly. sphere in the, and, and so that's why when you make the change to it, it it'll change it mathematically, and exactly, yeah, okay, okay, and it also has a number of other benefits. So, for example, you know, traditional, you know, in traditional CAD, you know, some typical operations are, you know, if you wanted to do uh, booleans or you wanted to, let's say, you have a box here and you have a lattice. Sitting combined with with the with the your structure, it could be let's say you have a sandwich structure. So you have a solid plate and you have a lattice and you have a solid plate. Okay. And you could use that to maybe to make a very lightweight part. Okay. And so for those cases, you know, if you if you used conventional CAD systems and you wanted to have a continuous blend between the lattice and the solid, then you would manually have to go in and click on each of the the each of the different beams, the connection points yeah, between the connection them. Points, yeah, yeah. And you can imagine if you have a solid, or if you have a lattice comprised of 100,000 beams, that quickly becomes a, a, an impossible task. You yeah, wouldn't yeah. be able to do. But you can ma make a script, right, for that process. Yes. Yeah. But the thing is that with implicit, with this implicit geometry kernel, what we can actually do is, we can do that, it's, it's, it's natural to the system. So we can do, by, we can do the blending with, on the underlying math. So, what, what this means is that we can blend in a matter, you don't have to do anything. You just have to, you know, the blending is defined in, in it's, it's done on the math equations. And so what this means is that you can do a blend which never fails and it's done fully automatically. And so this really gives you, again, you know, it removes the tedious, you know, parts of the design process. You don't have to write a script. Or you don't have to manually click on all the buttons. And this really also means that you can, you know, in your design process, you can quickly iterate through. So let's say you figure out, oh, I need to make it that is just a little bit bigger or a little bit wider. Everything is done in an automated fashion. Yeah, and so great. you don't have to go through that. You know, it, it just works. And I think that is, you know, one of the, you know, the powerful aspects of, of the geometry handle. And then your optimization that you were doing and then are bringing to topology is optimization within this geometry kernel? Yes, yes. that's correct. Okay, okay. And so it is part, so partly it is just conventional topology optimization as you see out there, but we are also looking into um, optimization using these, uh, these cellular materials. So for example, you, we can talk about gyroid structures or, or we can talk about lattice structures or honeycombs of these various foams. Mm -hmm. And such materials have actually shown to have excellent performance. Um, they can provide material, they, you know, if you zoom out sufficiently, you can actually consider them as materials. So if you have enough of these period, this periodic assembly of gyroids, you can actually consider them as materials. Mm. And what this means is that by going in and locally changing how the microstructure of these, these 
cellular materials, uh, you are changing the, the microstructure of these cellular materials, you can actually locally change how they sh respond to their materi macroscopic material properties. And what this allows us to do is actually tap into material regions which we haven't been able to before. So for example, we can make materials which are extremely lightweight with very high strength to rate ratio, mm -hmm. materials which isolate have a yeah, very good isolation properties, materials which uh, damp energy in a, in a very efficient, yeah, can absorb energy in a very efficient way. And so obviously, you know, these, using these materials in mechanical engineering design is obviously, you know, very, uh, it has a huge potential. And so what we're working on now is figuring out how can we do optimization using these material structures. And so, yeah, that's some of the stuff that we are working on now. And, uh, you know, the thing is with these materials that is that um, compared to conventional materials, you just have, okay, you have a finite number of materials that you can pick from. Mm -hmm. uh, but the thing is with these materials is that you have so many more, much, so much more option because now you can also go in and locally change maybe how thick should the beams be? Yeah, yeah. What orientation should they be? Yeah. How big should the cell size be? And so figuring that out is not trivial. And yeah, so yeah, yeah. what we are working on now is trying to figure out ways in which we can guide the engineer through the, the, the process of, of, of designing with these and building out workflows which enable an engineer to do oh, so. This is so cool. Okay. All right. So, so how, how do you s um, guide the engineer through the, through the, the pro you process? You gave the examples of, okay, it used to be just different materials, then it became, well, now you can go, uh, you can kind of double click and go in and see all of the connection points between those two plates and the lattice in between. Yeah, yeah. So, so how do you guide the engineer to then s to see for themselves that, oh, wow, that's an interesting way that Entopology is guiding me to learn yeah. that I can make this more functionable in, in the desire that I want it to be. So there are many different ways in which you can do this. And one way would be to actually use the same methods as, as we use for topology optimization. So automated optimization procedures to figure out how the distribution of, of these micro or these cellular materials should be. Mm -hmm. And so that would probably be the, you know, the most, you know, general, the, the fastest way and of doing it. Are you constantly running the optimization of the cellular materials so in the back, in the, you were constantly running the simulation in the background and then saying this would be more optimal? Yes. So it is run in the exact same way as you, you know, run conventional optimization processes. And so the way this works is that you set up your design space. You say, okay, this is my design region. Here I have some, here I fix it, here I fix it. Then I apply some external loads and then I say it must meet certain requirements. Mm -hmm. So for example, the stress must not exceed a certain value in this region yes. or, or the displacement must not be greater than some value in this region. And mm -hmm. you say it, it must also be lightweight and it, yeah. Mm -hmm. You set up these various constraints to the optimization problem. And essentially, the, once you have set up the optimization pr problem, and defined, you know, the overall constraints and objective. Yes. Then the underlying optimization. Which are all inputs into your. Exactly. So, your so okay. this would be the user which d sets up and defines the problem, and the optimization algorithm then figures out how the cellular material structure should be interesting. Should be uh, interesting. Yeah. Distributed. Yeah. Okay. So there's not, there's there's not even a chance for then um, an. A, an error really you're you're rolling with you're simulating out all of the exactly. possibilities and giving the best the thing is the thing is that if an engineer were to you know he has the engineer has so many different parameters that he can con, you know he can play with and it can really you know it's really an overwhelming you yeah. know it can really be an overwhelming you know experience because yeah there are so many different parameters that you can you, you can yeah. control and so what we are trying to do is set up um, workflows which enable the engineers to 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 actually be, yeah, guide the engineer through the you know this vast design space uh, and really allow the engineers to fully utilize the potential that these materials have because they can also be used in a you know if you if you don't select your 
your you know design the cellular material or the cellular structure properly, then it's not going to be better. It's absolutely not going to be better than what you can do with conventional design methods. So you really you know there is a high, higher knowledge requirement using a, by designing with these cellular materials, but there's also a greater potential. And yeah, yeah. what we are trying to do is just enabling engineers to actually tap into this this this. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Increased potential. That's right. Yeah, and this is so cool. It it th th there's both the 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 la the lattice, this this the cellular distribution, yeah, this, yeah, yeah, cellular, cellular ma ma matrix. Yeah, exactly. The cellular exactly. matrix that can look like a lattice or a honeycomb. Exactly. Okay. Or gyroid structure. Gyroid structure. So cellular matrix. So which is that's where you see yeah the angles of the different beams that you're exactly, talking about. Exactly. Exactly. And then that r being able to help with that process and help have the engineers say okay I see why that's optimal. It's going to have like we asked for all these variables. That's it's gr it's great. And then can you give us the examples that you find most relatable? For that, you gave a crane as a, as an example of where there's all those beams yes. and right. So cranes, one of them. Then what are other examples where this can be like applicably understood? So examples where you know, I would say any you know, if you want to make something you know very lightweight but also very you know highly performative, yes, it makes sense to do this. So it could be you know structures which have you know very high requirements in terms of weight saving. So for example, in the automotive industry yeah. or in, yeah. in the aerospace industry. Yeah. And so I think those and those two industries would definitely be, you know, solid. Okay, let me see if I can get this right then. So then the, the cellular matrix in the automotive and the aerospace industries, you don't want extra beams that are unnecessary. Yes. You, that's good. you can remove if you can remove beams and position them in in more solid ways to be able to hold um, to hold it together and have equal performance. Yes, you want that because exactly. it weighs less. Exactly. Okay, okay. So we want to optimally use the amount of it. You know, we want to only make use of the material that we actually need, and so we can use these optimization algorithms to figure out how how that is. You know, That's should so be done. Fascinating. Yeah. And yeah. so they also actually also use it quite a lot in uh, the medical industry. Okay. So you know these cellular materials, it's partly to do to you know for so they use it in the medical industry for implants. So they can actually let's say if you want to, you need your hip replaced mm. or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, what they do is you can have a customly made uh, 3D printed you know hip implant inserted into your body. And what what you want is of course it has to be lightweight. And yes. that is really where the cellular materials yes, you know yes. make sense. Uh, and another thing is, you know, it also has to, you know, fit into your body, and 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 with these, you know, cellular uh, or these cellular structures, the bone can actually grow into the Correct. Yeah, uh, yeah, grow yeah. into the uh, into into the three D printed cellular structure rather than re body reject it. Exactly. You, yeah. Exactly. You want ways for the body to actually incorporate it into. Exactly. It. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, I think you know, really, there is you know so many great opportunities to, to adopt this technology. And I think, you know, the reason why we haven't seen it before now is because because uh, additive manufacturing has really evolved a lot over the past years. And so yeah. this wouldn't really have been possible if you just go back 10 or 15 years. Yeah, because you would need to um, take an, the, the, the piece of, of raw material you have and try and and yes. actually carve out what yeah, you, and, yeah, 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 and yeah. you can imagine how that would have been if it was just if you had an assembly of or you had a structure comprised of just even a thousand beams, beams wouldn't yeah, even be possible. possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I think and now with additive it's it's you can you can you can make the tweak. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, additive manufacturing has really you know, it's the driver for, you know, what we are doing now. And yeah, it's yeah. It's, and it's also, you know, a great motivation because, you know... 3D it, printing is one form of additive yes, manufacturing. Yes, that's correct. That's yeah. correct. And the other popular forms? Um, additive? Yeah. Um, so I'm not so much into... I wonder, know, what, I wonder what else are, like, the other popular additive manufacturing forms. 
yeah, th I mean, 3D printing, and then, I don't know, maybe something related to biology, it could potentially be like an, uh, a yeah. form of yep, like an yep. additive. Yep, yep, exactly. Potentially like exactly. cell division yep. type stuff, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And so I think, um, you know, we are in an interesting time right now because, you know, if you go back 20 years, it was manufacturing that was the, you know, the limiting factor of the, you know, the evolution of te technology. You know, CAD software, you know, was on the forefront. Whereas now over the past 10 years, we have seen that, that the, um, that the, uh, you know, the manufacturing scene has evolved much faster than the CAD software. Interesting. And so now we are in a unique position where, you know, we are actually lagging behind. And that is also why I think it's so interesting to work at Anthropology Agreed, because yeah, yeah. now we have a unique opportunity to actually, you know, enable design. You know, we have s such great, you know, opportunity. Uh, we, the, the design space is almost unlimited now. And, you know, now we have the opportunity to develop tools which actually enable the engineer to, to, to tap into this. Yes, yes. Christian, a couple questions um, on the way out. One of the questions is, you know, we're here at COFES and there's so much cutting edge engineering software, including yours. Where do you see this all converging and going? Oh, that is a great question. Um, I think over the next couple of years, you know, we'll definitely see improvement in, you know, the, the technology, so topology optimization and, you know, just generative design tools, you know, those will definitely evolve because those are still, you know, they, they are not end to end solutions now and they still, I would say they are still in their infancy. And so I think over the next years we'll see, you know, we, you'll see, you know, with, you know, the increasing, you know, yeah, the compute power is just growing exponentially right now. And obviously that helps a lot, but I also think, you know, we'll see more methods development in these generative design approach or strategies and I think that will you know move the technology to a stage where it's also easier for for less experienced people to you know to get into the the industry and I think you know yeah. that is probably also the biggest barrier of entry right now you know that you, you still need you know some level of you know technical understanding to actually be able to operate and make sense of these tools um, so I think, you know, over the next maybe 10 years, you know, we'll see a larger adoption due to um, advancement in the underlying technology and the compute power. Yeah, yeah. The democratization is exactly. fascinating, yes. getting it into the hands of younger and younger people. Exactly. Now, um, last question is, what would you say is a important or maybe even the most important skill for kids and for even adults to learn going into this exponential technology age? So I think obviously have being uh, curious is it's very important, I think. Um, but even more so, I would say now in terms, you know, if, if it's just a technical skill, I would say programming. It, it, it's really amazing to see, you know, how, how much being a, learning this skill from a young age, how much it can do for you yeah. because, you know, you can essentially solve all problems with with programming and then you can later on in 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 your you know in your life you know pick up on you know the more advanced skills such as you know these yeah mathematical skills and understanding the physics but i would say even from a young age just getting started on programming is probably you know the best advice i can give you know it's 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 such a powerful tool and you can really solve so many problems with it and pretty much all the systems that we see today you know yeah have some form of programming you know yep. involved so i think having that skill or learning that skill from a young age would you know it yeah that's probably the best I c advice i can give yeah that's great curiosity programming powerful yeah. too yeah yeah definitely christian thank you so much for coming out right. to the show this it's has been, been a pleasure yeah it's been a huge pleasure all right yeah and this is like you know the way you've taught us about about what you're working on with optimization and um, what what Entopology is doing is 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 really beautiful. It's it's really well. You did a great job explaining it, and we greatly appreciate everyone for tuning in. Huge thank you. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Check out Christian's links and Topology's links below. Also check out Kofes's links below as well. Support the artists and entrepreneurs that you believe in. 
Our links are below, simulations links are below. Get more conversations, thought-provoking conversations about things like what we talked about into our communities. Inspire the next generation of people to build the future. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you so much. Thank you for tuning in, and we will see you soon. Peace. Bye. <laughs>